So actually, we have some changes in the schedule because uh, the original plan was to have here also coming from Interclinic, but he he's not here yet. So uh, and also Liz from Indiegogo uh, was one of our speaker, but there are some changes, and we have Steam. We have Steve here who will present, give a short introduction, he's from Indiegogo, he will make some a short introduction about crowdfunding campaigns, and we have also Misha and Carolina who will join the discussion panel. So, Steve, you can start, it would be great. Steve, can you start? Can you hear me? No. Oh. There's some really loud uh, feedback. Okay, can you hear here. me now? No? Can you hear me right now or no? No, still not good. But we can hear you, so we can start. <laughs> I can't really hear you. It's uh, very loud. Oh, that's a lot better. <laughs> Perfect. You can hear okay? So, good afternoon, everybody. Can you all hear me okay? This is my first uh, international video conference, so let me know if the video doesn't work or if things are moving too quickly. But I'm excited to talk to you guys, and thank you for having me. So my name is Steve. I'm the uh, Canadian tech hardware and design lead for Indiegogo. And uh, I've been working in the crowdfunding space for a pretty long time now. Crowdfunding holds a pretty special place to me because it's how I got my first business off the ground. I was able to have a campaign to raise capital, to validate a market, and to bring a product to life that was really a, just an idea that we played around with in our garage. And it was the way that uh, I learned how to uh, run a small business. And uh, the power of crowdfunding is uh, very apparent to me, so I'm really excited to be sharing that with you guys today. Um, Indiegogo is the world's largest open crowdfunding platform and it's a place where people can bring ideas, host campaigns and help raise money and awareness and market their ideas and bring them to life and uh, that's a really important thing to us and we're excited that uh, we have a growing global community of international campaigners who are looking to run campaigns and that's one of the great strengths of Indiegogo that we're really happy to share with you guys. Uh, over 220 countries a week right now contribute to Indiegogo campaigns, so it's really cool to be chatting with you guys in, in Poland and hopefully we can help bring some campaigns on board. Um, so I've got a, a few slides that I'm going to share with you and we're going to talk a little bit about Indiegogo as a campaign and also some of the things that you can get from a crowdfunding campaign other than just the money, though that's obviously a a fun and important part. So let me uh, try to bring these slides up for you. Is that working for you? Yeah. Okay, so two of the things that uh, I wanted to chat about today are both problems that startups and young entrepreneurs face very frequently. And the first one of those is a word that I heard a lot while I was getting my businesses started and that I hear a lot of other people who are about to run campaigns face. And uh, that's the, the word no. And whether you're chatting with a bank or talking to VCs or looking for advisors or partners, far too often we're told no, uh, an idea isn't ready or no, you can't have money or no, you're not approved. And 
crowdfunding is an amazing way to help change that no into the more preferred answer. And uh, we've uh, come across an awesome study where people have been exposed to do a very simple task and half of the group was shown the word no before they began their task and the other half wasn't. And the group that was exposed to the word no were completing their tasks almost three times slower than those who hadn't been exposed to the word no. And uh, it's the essence of uh, rejection, of failure and defeat. And we really want to, through Indiegogo and running strong campaigns, help small businesses turn those no's into yeses and to help find more positive ways and uh, supportive ways to get your ideas off the ground. Another thing that can be really frustrating when you are uh, starting a small business is getting feedback. And I think feedback has gotten a very bad reputation lately. Feedback usually means you're going to get bad news. If someone's going to give you good news, they'll usually just come right out and congratulate you and give you that news. When you're getting bad news, someone usually sits you down and you're across the table from them and they're like, we want to give you some feedback. And you get that sinking feeling in your stomach and you usually know bad news is coming. So in a crowdfunding campaign, I want to chat a little bit about why Indiegogo is not just about getting money. And uh, we've all been privy to large campaigns that have raised hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of dollars. But there's a ton of incredibly valuable information that can affect the longevity of your business, that can give you customer insights, and really shape the way that your product goes forward through running a campaign. The first of those is engaging with your customers and getting valuable feedback before your campaign begins and throughout your campaign before you deliver your product. And a story that we really love in this example is that of the Misfit Shine, which is a small wearable activity tracker. And Misfit was meant to be worn on your lapel. And they went out with a goal of raising $100,000 on Indiegogo and ended up clearing 800k but the most valuable thing that they learned during their campaign is that the customers didn't want to necessarily wear the device on their collars or their backpack straps they wanted a bracelet or they wanted a necklace so in the midst of the campaign misfit was able to launch both a bracelet and a necklace as a perk they saw an immediate increase in contributions and we're able to shape the way that their product was both made and packaged, which is now available in the Apple store all over the place. So it's just an incredible customer insight that they were able to get through their campaign before they even went into production. The second thing we love to learn is getting valuable market data before you launch your product. And a cool campaign that's just wrapping up on Indiegogo is called Tinkerbots and they're little roboticized Lego pieces. Tinkerbox already had funding. They had VC backing. They had uh, the money to go into production. But they wanted to run a crowdfunding campaign to learn how to package their product. They wanted to know if people wanted to buy big boxes of loose pieces, if they wanted to be able to build specific shapes. And through their campaign, they blew past their $100,000 goal, but they also had the customer insight now at the other end to figure out how to package their product in the way that people wanted to buy it. And it's just incredibly valuable information as they go into production and start to source packaging. The third thing that we like talking with potential campaigners about is validating the need or desire for change. And one of our favorite stories in this space happened in Turkey last year during uh, the protests. And three global citizens wanted to get their story out there and they knew that there were some real issues with press getting into Turkey and, and their stories getting out. And they wanted to buy an a ad in the New York Times, a full page ad. And that ad's pretty expensive, cost about $50,000 to run a full page ad in the Times. But on Monday morning, they launched their campaign. On Wednesday, their campaign closed at $108,000. And on Friday, a full page ad talking about what was happening in Turkey ran in the New York Times. And most impressively, the following Tuesday, over 2,000 press outlets across the world had picked this story up. So through crowdfunding in Indiegogo, these three individuals were able to reach more people than they ever would have been able to through traditional means. 
The final thing we love is bringing an idea to life that no one thought would work. And we have a ton of examples for this on Indiegogo. And the one I'm going to share with you is the hometown Toronto favorite. And uh, that's a company called the Muse Headband. And they have a brain sensing headband. And VC after VC turned these guys down, telling them that their product wasn't ready for market, that the market wouldn't understand what they were trying to sell. So they came to Indiegogo to run a campaign to validate their market. And not only did they surpass their $150,000 goal, they raised over a quarter million dollars. They were also able to bring the market research needed to raise a $6 million round soon thereafter. Sorry, is everything okay still? Uh, we lost you when you tried when you when you tried to change the slide. We can hear we can hear you, but we have frozen screen. How far back was it? No, no, just Can you try to show your camera again? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, is that working again? Yeah. Okay. So how far in did, we, did I lose you? Did you guys see this slide? No. So this is the, the Muse headband who raised over a quarter million dollars on their $150,000 goal, but they were able to validate a market large enough to follow up with the investors who had been turning them down time after time after time. And they went on to raise a $6 million Series A round using the market validation that they got through their Indiegogo campaign. So it was a pretty fascinating way to um, validate a market to both pre-sell their product and to show investors that there are people out there who wanted their idea and what they had to offer. And we're starting to talk to more and more investors who are encouraging hardware companies to run a crowdfunding campaign before coming for investment, to validate that market, to test out their retail pricing, to launch a new idea. And the market validation and research and knowledge that you get through a campaign can really help you go on to raise some serious capital out the other end. So some more specific things about Indiegogo, uh, three pillars that we really stand behind are being global, open, and providing a lot of support. Um, over 200,000 campaigns have run on Indiegogo, 224 countries. We operate in five currencies across four languages, and we have people on the ground in Canada, in Germany, in UK, in Australia, and across the US. Indiegogo is a completely open platform. Uh, we encourage entrepreneurial projects that are hardware related. We encourage creative campaigns that may be film and music driven. And we have an amazing number of cause campaigns as well. There's no application or approval process. Anybody with an idea can bring that to Indiegogo and um, help fund it and bring it to life. And Indiegogo is also completely merit based. So. When you come to the home page, when you click through each of the categories, the campaigns that you see are the ones that have been able to drive momentum and success for themselves. There's no one hiding in a back room picking which campaigns are going to be shared. Um, everything from social media shares to campaign momentum, uh, page views are all driving your campaign forward. And so no matter where you are in the world, you have a chance to really expose yourself to the, the ton of viewers that come to Indiegogo each month. One thing we really pride ourselves on is support. Uh, we have a 24-hour response time from our customer happiness team. If you have any questions when you're getting your campaign set up or during your campaign, we have a lot of materials we can help provide you with when it comes time to running a campaign. If you have any questions about what you should be focusing on, on how to create your messaging, on how to form your perks, on when it's a good time to crowdfund for your company, we've got a lot of resources that help make those answers really easy. And a really awesome part of it in Indiegogo is also our flexible versus fixed funding models. And on competing platforms, there's often a fixed goal where if you don't reach 
your financial target, you don't get any of the money up to that point. And on Indiegogo, we offer a flexible funding option where you can still take the money home that you raise beneath your goal. And a lot of people have been able to use those funds in order to try to find additional financing to bring an idea to life or to simplify their product a little bit and bring an MVP to the market for those who are able to support them. So some of the numbers that we're looking at with Indiegogo right now, millions of dollars are dispersed each week uh, across the world, about 7,000 campaigns active at any given time. About 30% of our business is international right now, so that pertains very specifically to you guys in Poland. We've got a very growing audience of international shoppers. Over 70 countries contributing to campaigns each day. 9 million, and I think that this is closing in on 12 million now, unique monthly views from all over the world. A thousand percent in growth in funds raised over the last two years. In February, we closed a $40 million Series B round, which has been focused on our international growth and expansion. So getting those people on the ground in each of those countries I mentioned and making sure that they're available to you when you want to ask questions, when you have uh, ideas about your campaign and want to get some valuable feedback. Uh, contributions to campaigns outside the U.S. are increasing very, very quickly. So we really are trying to support that global market. And while you're definitely going to have an incredible audience in North America and the States, getting people all around the world to see your project is an imperative to us and we're something we're really excited about. Since this slide's been made, we've also had a really exciting uh, announcement that Richard Branson Max Levchin, the co-founder of PayPal, and Megan Smith from Google X have all become investors of Indiegogo and are coming on as advisors. So the landscape is changing very quickly and in a very exciting way. And uh, it's an incredible time to be a part of the, the crowdfunding story. And at uh, Indiegogo, uh, your valuable experiments always begin with a yes. And that's all I got for you today, guys. Thanks for listening. Okay, thanks, Steve. Uh, so now I would like to introduce and give stage to Misha and Karina. Steve, can you hear? Can you hear us? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's go. Let's go. So maybe now Karina and Misha will share their experience with their campaigns. So who starts? I can start. <laughs> uh, I would agree with uh, everything, actually, what uh, Steve said, uh, because uh, when we uh, were launching our Kickstarter campaign, uh, we've met uh, actually every issue that uh, was mentioned uh, in a presentation. Uh, our company, Zortrex, uh, is a manufacturer and supplier of uh, 3D printers. But one year ago, when we started our journey with Kickstarter, we thought that we're just a manufacturer of 3D printers. Now we know that we are a supplier of professional solution for small and uh, medium business. And now I think that's the key, because uh, when we started, uh, we had no experience with uh, business in the United States. Uh, and with some uh, PR activity in the United States. At, and Kickstarter was uh, some kind of school for that. And it was a uh, great experience uh, and some kind of uh, lesson. And now we're uh, about one year after our, uh, our uh, campaign. Uh, our goal was to... Um, to have uh, $100,000. Uh, we had $180,000. Uh, uh, and we wanted to find uh, money for production of our first uh, part of 100 uh, printers. Uh, so now, uh, when we had uh, our Kickstarter campaign, we had one prototype, or maybe it was one or three prototypes of our printer. Now we have... Uh, thousands uh, units. So uh, I think uh, in this one year, we skipped from the first, our first experience with uh, crowdfunding on Kickstarter to a great developing company. So, so for me, it was like uh, the, the biggest milestone uh, in whole uh, development of uh, our company. Questions or the next case study? <laughs> 
Other any questions? Okay, so Misha. Well, I uh, come from the music world, so um, of course uh, in the um, music world and in the film world, uh, crowdfunding is um, quite popular as well. We did a campaign, it's like, well, three years ago already, when I think Beast Fund was only just very starting. I'm not sure even if Polak Potrafi existed. Um, we did consider using um, Kickstarter, but I didn't feel completely sure if um, the tax issues were regulated and you know organized for other territories, which uh, of course they were not. Um, so because we weren't sure how it works and it wasn't very like big and known in Poland um, then, we decided to do it completely ourselves. And we build our own website, which was literally like, I have no tech idea about how stuff works and I'm not a developer and I'm really not, you know, a pro. Um, and whenever I work with like building websites, I use these drag and drop templates that you pay five or 10 bucks for a month and that's how you build your website. And that's how our website was built, the one that we crowdfunded our budget uh, through. Um, it was a very simple website. It had a Polish and an English version. It had a banner on top with um, uh, with the point, basically, uh, explaining how um, we needed the money and how we wanted to include the people uh, in the process. It had an info about the band and it had the pay button. So it had a lot of like call for action sort of here's the band, here you can pay, here you can be a part of, you know, our uh, story and our record. Um, we didn't have the well, financial goal. We had a set time, which was the closing date, which was the date when we had to enter the studio and record, because we essentially needed the money to pay for the studio. Um, and what we did, we didn't have all these uh, different price points, which is just a choice we made. I actually think that different price points is a very good idea to test, um, like what Steve was saying, test retail prices, for example, for certain things. If you, for example, decide to have a direct -to fan campaign on your website and sell different packages and different products at different price points, a campaign like that would be a good idea and then you would need to have different price points. But what we decided was we decided to have one package which you had one price only, which was a hundred zwarte, so it was an easy amount. The package included the CD, the ticket for the show, and a little thank you note. We had a thank you page in the booklet of the record with all the people mentioned. That was it. So actually, the, the CD and the ticket, that was also a cost. So essentially, out of the 100, maybe 30% 30, 30 of the money was something that we got as a gift. The other was a cost, so something that we had to give later back to the people. But the money was on our account, so it was a pre-sale sort of, uh, you know, a campaign. They weren't like investors. It wasn't like the same type that you uh, did. It's, it's, it's much more, it's much simpler and also way smaller scale as well. But it works for a band to crowdfund a budget that way. You, people pay for a record that they will later receive. They're curious what you will make. They trust that it will be good of course it's you know they have no idea what you will come up with so if you it could happen that they're not happy about you know what you made but it's the risk they, they take but the risk is actually on you because you might use a fan well, you know l lose a fan um, anyway that that was the way we did it um, we didn't have a financial goal like I said we had a final date we didn't have an amount of the packages that we had to sell. We had one price point. Yeah, we basically were able to pay for the studio when we entered the studio. So I consider it a success. We didn't get 
a million dollars, but it was enough to pay for the studio. Questions? Any questions? There's, I see a guy who bought a package in the crowd, thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Hi. My name is Waldek. Uh, I just uh, got a short question. Uh, how did you market your website? I mean, how did you advertise your, your website to get uh, traffic mm -hmm. on it? Very good question. Um, we decided not to, like, advertise it random places because we thought that there's no point in, like, putting it in, like, big newspapers and stuff because it will be... It's, it's only going to take, like, two months or so, and we have some people via our digital touch points like Facebook, like our website, like the newsletter, and we will just aim for them and see how much traffic that will bring. And that actually ended up being enough. Uh, we didn't, because it didn't, it was not like huge amounts of money that we needed. So just having, you know, a couple hundred people buy the package was enough to pay our studio costs. If it were a bigger campaign, like if we needed much more money, I would consider having other campaigns and then I would, we usually partner with like magazines or work with, you know, journalists and you do know w which ones you'd have to aim for because you know what your fan is listening to uh, radio wise or TV wise or blogs they read, stuff like that. Um, or if like, or you should. The, the ideas that you should, so I would aim for that, but um, we actually, with that particular campaign, only went for the actual people that were already our fans on Facebook and via the, you know, channels we use. Okay, thank you. And since I still have a microphone, I've got one more question uh, to the lady from the trucks. Uh, actually, the, the question is the same. Uh, did you uh, make any... Um, a campaign before you launch uh, your campaign on the Kickstarter? I mean, did you advertise somewhere? Or what have you done to, to get uh, uh, some more users except the users from Kickstarters? When we started uh, our campaign, we didn't have uh, such experience uh, like now. Uh, so we, we weren't uh, prepared for campaign. Uh, actually, we based on the Kickstarter activity and some uh, technical journalists uh, from TechCrunch, for example, and um, media like this. So uh, I think uh, it could be done better uh, if we uh, would prepare uh, some marketing and PR activity before. But uh, as I said before, it was some kind of lesson. So if I would uh, do it one more time, it would be easier for me to, to prepare, for example, three uh, months before uh, and start with some uh, PR activity, for example. And I think uh, the result uh, would be better. But of course, uh, it's easier to, to achieve your goals on dedicated platform like uh, Indiegogo on Kickstarter uh, instead of uh, having your own campaign because uh, Indiegogo or, or Kickstarter is just a brand, just a brand. So it, it's easier, uh, but uh, of course it's more interesting to do something yourself, <laughs> as Misha, for example. Um, also, to, you know, to 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 interest the fans that are already subscribed, that that's also something that's that's a task as well. Like we aimed for them, but y you do um, have to interest them somehow. And first, uh, well, we we were just very lucky because the people got interested. But then we wanted to keep others um, involved, and that's something that we could have started earlier now. I, I thought about it. Um, okay, I'm going to say what, I'm, what, I, what I have in mind. Uh, we announced the title of the record, for example, um, in riddles. So we didn't do like, uh, you know, so today, this is Monday, 10 o'clock, the album is called 40 Wings of Courage. But we, like, every hour posted a riddle. Um, of which the first is 40, so it was like a hardcore math equation uh, for people to solve. And I think that's, all, that's something um, that could have been done earlier to kind of advertise the packages. And I think if you, even if you um, address it only to the people that are already subscribed and are your fans, 
uh, you can still get super creative with the way you promote it to them. Any questions? One more. So I have a question, I guess, maybe more to Misha. Um, so do you pl maybe plan to do it again, or is it just exclusively a one-shot thing? I mean, is one allowed to do it again, or is crowdfunding uh, strictly a one-shot thing? Well, you know, I think with companies it's different, because if you really, like crowdfund a successful product and you have a startup and you're working on something, then based on that you can already like, you know, work, work around it. I did the campaign with a band that I don't work with anymore. So with my new project, I could totally have a crowdfunding campaign. Also because it, what is very important is not only that you're asking for money, it's all of what Steve was talking about. It's the data. It's involving the people in the process. Crowdfunding is useful in many other ways than only getting money. So I do think that you know you are allowed to do it multiple times if you're like an artist um, or filmmaker or a photographer, and you do different projects. You can approach it a different way and and still run a couple campaigns. I don't see why not. Can I add to that? Yeah. Uh, so we actually see a lot of people in the film space run repeat campaigns, but it, it's something that I'm very excited about working with companies. Um, and I think that that comes through your marketing and your messaging where the crowdfunding campaign is not just a way for you to make money so that your company can survive. If you change the metric of success about trying to reach a new market, um, to talk about pricing, to do an international push to another country to get your product out there, you get to control the reason of why you're running your campaign. And if you can shift that away from it being exclusively about how much money can we raise, I think it's something that can be applied every time you want to test out a new space or launch a new product. Um, whether you're doing that through your own website or through a crowdfunding platform, the idea would be that the crowdfunding platform acts as an amplifier in order for you to take the idea and the network and the momentum and the press that you have directly around you and then to kind of put that out into the platform and allow it to amplify for you to reach new markets and to um, really get that international exposure. And before you're running a campaign, a lot of people are under the, the perception that they can kind of make their video, fill the text out and just press go and sit back and the money will magically fall into their bank accounts. Uh, it's a very active process. You need to, for the 30 to 60 days your campaign is running, constantly be reaching out to people, um, having a PR plan, getting your personal networks to share your story getting press and marketing yourself throughout the entire duration of the campaign. And the more momentum you can push towards your campaign page, the more the platform will be able to respond and help amplify that story. So I don't think it necessarily needs to apply to only your first campaign. And we're constantly looking for campaigners and businesses to work with who don't maybe fit the traditional crowdfunding model, but have incredible ideas that we could help bring to life. Um, I've got a question to Steve, I guess. Don't you think that developing this whole idea would eventually kill it? When, you know, just to put it simply from the viewpoint of the person who would like to support so, some campaign, how many campaigns you can support? Like a year ago, there was one band asking people for money for studio, and now it's like 100 bands. So don't you think that, you know, Gathering. I mean, um, the more people are interested, the it's harder. The competition is harder. I think that in Indiegogo, one thing that we're very supportive of is that anybody can put their idea up. And while big ideas will always come to the top, the more international-facing concepts that get a lot of press will raise up. We don't want to curate those campaigns in a way that someone with a very meaningful, impactful and uh, worthwhile story but isn't necessarily looking for a ton of money shouldn't be refused the chance to crowdfund. And so while that does create an increasingly large number of people in the marketplace, 
the marketplace itself is also growing very quickly. Like we're seeing up to 12 million unique monthly views and that is vastly changing as well. So as more campaigns are coming in the pipeline, there are um, in parallel more people who are coming to the platform to look for new ideas. And I think that a lot of people who support crowdfunding campaigns are not necessarily looking to shop online as opposed to really find cool ideas that emotionally connect with them and resonate with their ideals and, um, and want to help support it and bring it to life. And I think that the more ideas that are out there that tell those compelling stories, the better off we are. I'm, I don't think we're too concerned about it becoming oversaturated and people not contributing anymore. If, if I can, if I can just add to that, like um, I think um, in the first panel, uh, Ashwin said something that was really interesting. Uh, he said that a lot of people buy DVDs and they have them unopened at home. They buy an experience because they, I don't know, went to the cinema or they want to have that movie because they like it very much because they saw it, whatever, wherever, blah, blah. And they want to keep it, but they don't watch it at home again. You can support the different, the, the hundred different bands you mentioned um, for different reasons and they can offer different things. So you buy one you know in one band you buy a ticket to the concert with with another band you you buy you buy it you know you, you buy different things from different bands you buy the experience and it might be important for you i don't know for a different reason i just thought uh, thought that it uh, it's connected also with what ashvin said before uh okay question for me for all of you guys it's nice to hear conversations about marketing and promotions and all of that because it is such an integral part of the business uh, the success of a business but a lot of I find that here in Poland a lot of uh, brands and bands let's say don't they're, they're quite reactionary and kind of in chaos mode where they need to get money now, they need to solve problems now, have results now. Whereas marketing, that kind of stuff, building your audience, knowing who your audience is, all those different aspects of marketing, it's such a, it, it takes some time. And they don't, people don't have time here a lot of times. So how can uh, people realize that you do need to stop and think about these little aspects or what can you tell bands let's say or brands that they need to do in order to quickly gain audiences to quickly understand who they're talking to quickly um you know it, it communicate what who they are and what they are in the way that they are without drawing it out and getting the results that they need quickly does that make sense steven maybe uh, I, I'm kind I, of yeah. talking to you. I think that you're um, totally on point with that. And while many people learn things in a positive way through a, a crowdfunding campaign, people also learn very important lessons about what they may be doing wrong and what their brand is missing out on through a campaign. And if you've got this idea that you bring to a campaign thinking that it's going to be a smashing hit and it isn't, you get to learn that lesson much faster and for much less invested money than you would if you actually tried to take that product to market and found out the very long and hard way that your brand or your story or your product isn't going to sell as well as you thought it was going to. And uh, I think that, again, kind of going back to this idea of moving the metric of success away from just financial gain through a campaign, it's really validating that market and knowing if your brand carries a compelling enough story to engage people. Um, is that answering what you were getting at? Uh, yeah, I guess in a way, I, I, it's good to hear coming from somebody like you, the importance of that, the importance of not just doing something quickly to get to, you know, solve your solve your problems, but to actually stop and think through the process. So say in bands that maybe are more thinking, okay, we need to make we need to make an album right now. We have this much money that we need to need to pull together. They don't have time to sit back and think necessarily. Well, I mean, I guess in the case of bands, they kind of do know their audiences a little bit more. So with Zortex, maybe you don't know exactly who your audience is yet or exactly who your fans are yet. And it's difficult to 
get them to, yeah, just to understand that it is an important factor. But I think you had to invest some time, for right. example, one month for your campaign to get more time later for your development. So it's, I think it's normal, it's just a business strategy uh, and everyone should think about it. Yeah. Any other questions? I got one question to Steve. Steve, because Indiegogo is not so popular in Poland, so maybe you can give us some information what's the difference between Kickstarter and Indiegogo and make something like a bigger exposure about Indiegogo in Poland. Differences between the two platforms? Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, I'm more than comfortable to chat about that. Uh, I actually have personally ran a Kickstarter campaign in the past, so I do have some valuable insights on both sides of the platform. One thing that I really love about Indiegogo is its openness to helping you create a campaign that helps you learn about your demographic and market before forcing you to bring a product to life. And what good is all of the market knowledge and data that you collect during the course of your campaign if you aren't very carefully applying that to the product that you bring to market afterwards? And we really encourage the companies that we work with to make sure that they're engaging with their audiences, that they're getting that feedback, and they're also letting that shape their company so that the longevity of what they create and who they become is something that can extend far after the campaign. We're not about just bringing this one product to market. Um, we really want to help build sustainability. Another element that um, really reinforces that is the fact that on Indiegogo, you can buy multiples of a specific unit in a campaign. So on competing campaign um, platforms, you can't always buy two or three or four of a specific unit, even if you're really interested in it. And that makes it really difficult for campaigns to pick up retail or distribution through their, through their campaign. We've had an amazing story uh, a women's underwear line called Nixwear in Canada last year picked up national distribution through one of the biggest department stores in the country through their campaign because that distributor was able to buy multiples online. Uh, another really cool plugin that's coming from Indiegogo is called Outpost. And what that allows you to do is run your campaign in your own domain. So you don't have to spend your marketing efforts and dollars directing people towards Indiegogo's website slash your project, you can run your campaign in your own domain website with all of the uh, functions of a normal campaign page. And that campaign would also be mirrored on the Indiegogo website. So anyone who is shopping uh, through Indiegogo or browsing the website and came across, you could see your campaign there, but you could also be directing all of your marketing dollars towards driving people to your website. Okay, thank you. Any questions? No, so thank you. Thank Thanks you. Steve for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thanks.